following the rule. It's <laughs> awesome. That's cool. Yeah, when we were in worship, I um, kind of just had this thought in my, in my heart that was, uh, that was cool. It, it was this thought that, you know, you don't have to bring your best to church, but you do need to bring yourself to church. Yeah, I mean, just think about Jesus, right? Like, and I'll let the ringing hopefully stop. I don't want to, are we good? All right. Yeah, because like, uh, you know, think about Jesus. When people came to Jesus, was he like, oh, hold on. You're not bringing me your best. You've you got to wait before I can talk to you or heal you or minister to you. No. They came with their need. They came needing him, and he immediately filled the need. That's Jesus. And so uh, I just want to encourage you, like, maybe, I, I don't know, maybe you didn't bring your best today, and, and that's fine. There's no judgment for that. If you're coming and you're honest and you're bringing who you are to God, saying, God, I need your help, that's good. That's very good. Um, so Untold Stories, this is a, it's a fun series. Um, I recently, well, probably over the past few months, I've come to really the firm conclusion on something. I've come to the firm conclusion that I am uh, kind of weird. And... Um, <laughs> Oh, somebody laughed at that the wrong way, but uh, no, you're good. No, I, I have. I've come to this conclusion because, well, I'll show you why in a second here. There's a couple things. Is, is the way I process things is just different, and I used to kind of think, oh, you know, everybody's that way, and it's, it's not true, <laughs> and, and the way, like, that, that my mind works. So anyway, Buddy came to me and was like, hey, we're doing this series. You know, do you want to be on the schedule for it? It's called Untold Stories, and we're focusing on stories in the Bible or, or topics in the Bible that don't get talked about in church. And my eyes like lit up and I'm like, oh, I can talk about anything. Yeah. And the, uh, <laughs> the first thoughts that came in my head, and this is, I think, proof positive that I'm a, I'm a little bit weird, uh, was a list of potential sermon topics, uh, sermon titles. So we'll kind of just run through them one at a time here. So list of potential sermon titles for this series that I'm not going to, I'm not going to do any of these, but I really kind of thought about it. It was my first thought. So first one, Old Testament genocide. That's a fun one to talk about, right? <laughs> um, yeah, it's exciting, encouraging stuff you'll leave ministered to. Uh, no, but I mean, it's, it's an interesting topic that's not talked about where sometimes God will kill lots and lots and lots of people in the Old Testament. It happens. Like, think about the flood, wiping out basically everyone on the earth. That's kind of a big deal, right? And so, kind of talking through why did God do that during this specific time in history, it, it's kind of, it would be kind of an interesting discussion, I think. So that's one possibility. Uh, next one, polygamy. Don't you do it. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't talk about polygamy, right? Does, nobody wants to fight me on that. Nobody's like, oh, hey, I'm going to argue with you about that one. No, like, um, but it's in the Bible, right? There are plenty of people who had multiple wives in the Bible, and so it's something that's, you know, talked about, even though there's probably not, like, teaching on it necessarily. There is a topic there. And, uh, this one I've thought about quite a bit recently, um, and it's primarily because, so when I said that, everyone kind of laughed, like, oh yeah, like, polygamy is obviously not something you should do, right? Like, it's like, of course not. Um, it sits outside of our culture as taboo and, and wrong, and therefore we, I don't even have to, I don't even have to preach a message on that. I don't even have to tell you why it's wrong. You just already know that. Um, but what's interesting about polygamy is that, <laughs> you know, it sits outside our culture, and no one talks about it, even though there's some stuff in the Bible that talks about it. But there are plenty of other topics that are within our culture that are argued about and talked about and thought of as good and right and true by some people and wrong by others. And we, we fight and talk about those things. But I've been using polygamy in my study when I, when I read. And maybe this is a tool. Maybe it's not. I don't know. It, it helps me. But I start thinking about this. If I'm, if I'm studying something in Scripture, trying to figure out, is this good and true and right? What I do is I go is the thing that I'm looking at, does it have more or less scriptural basis than polygamy? If it has less scriptural basis than polygamy, I probably shouldn't think it's good and true and right. <laughs> and this applies to a lot of topics. So I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. I could, but we're not. So that's one of the titles. Uh, next one, what's up with demon possession? It's kind of weird, right? It happens a lot, in, especially with Jesus. He's going, you know, casting out demons and dealing with people with unclean spirits. I, I don't know if I've really encountered anybody with that, though. I mean, maybe I have and I haven't known it, right? But, but so anyway, that's another topic. 
Next one, church correction, delivering people to Satan. Uh, that's, again, another one we're not going to talk about. Everyone got, like, real nervous, like, wait, what is that? <laughs> it's a thing. Paul did it. Um, and I don't even really know what it means, to be honest with you. There's not like a big definition of what delivering someone to Satan was. There was this person, um, a little background, so I'm not terrifying you <laughs> if, you have, if you don't know about it. But someone was really doing something in a church that was really wrong and hurtful. And they were proud about it. And they were corrected about it. But they didn't, they didn't change anything about the way they were doing or, or thinking or talking about it. And so Paul came to this very strong conclusion that this person needed to be delivered unto, the, unto Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit might be saved. So the ultimate goal that Paul was trying to get to was salvation for this individual. Um, it wasn't, you know, for their destruction purely. Uh, but anyway, that's a topic that we could talk about. We're not going to. Okay, next one. Uh, I'm setting up the, other, the, the pastors here for like, maybe you guys can talk about, you know, if you don't have to. Uh, next one. This one's kind of interesting. Creation before creation, question mark? Um, so we know about, if you've been in church, you know about like the seven days of creation, right? When God created everything. But it is interesting. Genesis 1.1 starts off with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. That's Genesis 1.1, start of the Bible. Verse two is, and God said, let there be light. And there was light interesting that it would appear, if we're reading this linearly, which I guess you don't have to, but the way I read it is, there was the heavens and the earth, and then God created light. So for how long was the heavens and the earth here, and how long was the spirit hovering over the waters before the seven days of creation? I don't know. I have no idea. It's an untold story, right? We, we don't really know, and um, there's probably, there's lots of discussion about that, um, and you can Search it on the internet if you want to. Uh, actually, you can search all of these on the internet if you want to, but we're not going to talk about them today. So here, here's why I bring all that up. It's to bring up this idea that, you know, I think we're all, in our own unique way, a little bit weird, maybe. That's like one of the ways in which I'm weird, where someone gives me a sermon topic and I go off the wall immediately to all of these strange topics that we're not actually going to cover. Uh, and I got to thinking about that, and I... I just went, man, God, I think everyone's probably this way a little bit. Another kind of interesting story here, I, um, as part of my journey to discovering that God made me uniquely, that God made me a little different, is I'm, I'm actually a pretty good athlete. Um, historically, I have been. But my work, we had this uh, work outing where we went to a bowling alley. And uh, so anyway, we're all like, you know, eating food or whatever. And I get up to bowl, and um, I'm terrible at bowling like horrendously bad. I bowled a 40 in 10 frames with my work colleagues. And like, I'm bowling and it's like into the gutter, into the gutter, into the gutter. And like, people are giving me like funny looks like, are you okay, man? Like, like is something wrong? I'm like, how do you get the ball to go straight that far? Like, it's super far. And you guys are like, oh, it's not that hard. No, it's super hard. So anyway, so I'm really bad at bowling. And I think that's strange. And, but also at that work meeting, we had an executive come in who was like, pretty high up at the company and he's like from out of state and everyone's kind of like walking around in eggshells basically around the guy and they're like looking at each other like hey do you, you know do you want do you want to go talk to him or whatever and they're like some, somebody gave me like a like a nod like hey do you want me to go with you so you can like introduce yourself and I'm like I don't need a wingman to go talk to somebody like, like this is like you know he's just a person so like I went up and introduced myself but like that was weird right so we're all unique in our own way but for me that wasn't a problem for you bowling's probably not a problem but it is for me I got home and told Jana about my, uh, my, me bowling a 40, and she, you know, as the kind, supportive wife that she is, she asked me, did you ask him to put the bumpers up for you? I was like, oh, <laughs> thank you for that, Jana. So sweet. <laughs> but yeah. So anyway, I landed on this thing that I'm kind of weird, kind of different. And I would bet you probably are too. And then I started thinking about that and going, I think I'm an untold story. I think you're an untold story. There's never been someone like you on the earth. There's never been someone like me. Let's go to Psalm 139, 13 through 14. Verse 13 here. This is God doing this. For you formed my inward parts. You, need, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your, are your works. My soul knows it very well. Yeah. 
You're fearfully and wonderfully made. God had intention for you when he created you. You're not a mistake. The way he made you is not a mistake. Your personality is not a mistake. I grew up, I'll tell you this, I, <laughs> as a kid, I recognized that for whatever reason, I seemed to have greater impact on other people than they had on me, and I seemed to have greater impact on other people than they had on each other. And it always bothered me because I just wanted to blend in and fit in. It was always something that I was like, oh, I don't really like that about myself. Why can't I just be one of the normal kids who kind of just doesn't end up leading things, <laughs> who doesn't end up being the first to do things, who doesn't end up disrupting whatever's happening. It, it, was, it was a thing for me. And I had to come to this conclusion that God had a purpose and a plan for my life, that he wanted me that way. He created me that way. Maybe I'm supposed to be someone who disturbs the norm. That's what God's called me to be. You might have areas of your life where you look back and you go, man, well, God, why did you make me this way? Oh, he's got a plan and a purpose. He, there's a reason he made you that way. Don't hate what God created. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. And not only that, skip down a couple verses here. Verse 16, this is great. He made you with purpose. Verse 16 says, Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. Oh, God has a book with your life in it. God has your days set out bef before you. He's got a story that's in his heart that he's already written for your life. He's got a plan for you. But your story's untold. And it's, we, we should not be discouraged in our life when we encounter hard times because your story was written by God. It's just untold and you don't know where it's going yet. Isn't that a cool adventure? Don't you love a good book? Some of you might. A good book where, if you're reading a book, no one wants a book or even a movie. Let's talk about narrative just in general. Books and movies would be pretty boring if it was just everything's good every step of the way. You have this wonderful, wonderful moment where you get to acknowledge that you're a book or a story that God's telling, and you get to live it as it happens. That's amazing stuff. And let's go here, 1 Peter 2.9. 1 Peter 2.9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous, marvelous light. I love this verse. Do you see how God has taken you as his own? The, the King James, there's a portion of here that I, that's interesting in the King James. I don't think it's a fully accurate translation, but I think it's interesting. Where it's at verse 9 uh, where it says, a people for his own possession. The King James calls you a peculiar people, which is so, so interesting to me. And, I, and even though that's, it does probably literally mean a people for his own possession, not a peculiar people, I see that in the verse here, though. Think about it. If you're in the culture, we are, we're all living in, in a culture. All Christians have always lived in some culture <laughs> in the world. God has taken you and set you apart within it. He has taken you for his own possession, which means nothing else can own you. You cannot be owned by anything else. No ideology, no politician, no agenda has a right over you. You are God's. And because of that, you are going to be a little bit peculiar. <laughs> because of that, you're going to be set apart. That's why it's always bothering to me when, when people are like <laughs> trying to fit scripture into our culture. I just go, why? Why would we ever, or, or even fit ourselves into our own culture? Why? You're called to be set apart. You're called to be different. You're not called to be just like everybody else. Why would you want to be? Why would we expect Scripture to conform to our norm? God's called us into his norm. What, why would that ever be our expectation? It's confusing to me. <laughs> you should be a little bit different. Well, and I even think about this, you know, and... Um, I approach this a little bit cautiously because 
I, I look at this and I just say, can, can we maybe push back on this idea too that I'm sure some of you, if you've been, some of you study scripture, right, and, and you've been in at least aware of some scholarly ways of looking at scripture, there is a way of looking at it that I just kind of push back on a little bit. And it's, you know, people will look at scripture and they'll study it and they'll say, well, we, sh you know, we shouldn't read this with our own cultural eyes. We should look back to the culture in which it was written and try to understand what they're saying based on the culture they were in at the time. And I just need to push back on that just a bit and just say, and I'll just say this, you won't hear this probably anywhere else because I, I don't, I've never heard this anywhere else, but I think it's probably true. The people writing this in their own culture were separate from their own culture, right? They were not in it. They were set apart. When they're writing, their primary perspective is not the world in which they live. It's a heavenly perspective. So, so how do we go about using historical influences to dictate what was said? I mean, it's a little bit, that's not a stable foundation, I wouldn't say. I mean, we really need the Spirit of God to help us understand. Now, I'm not saying you can't use history and all that. That's why I'm a little bit, you know, because history's there. It's real. And people were writing in a historical context. I get it. But you get what I mean. I, I, hope, I hope that comes through clear enough. But, yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, let's, let's do this. So, so we all have a story, right? We're all living this story out. It's meant to be unique. We're meant to do it separately. And as I was kind of thinking about that, I started thinking about, okay, God, like what, what is important in my life? And I landed on a couple stories um, that are short. You may not have heard them in the Bible. They're there, but you might not have heard them or you may have heard them a long time ago or something. They're not talked about often. The first one's in 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 23, 11. And this is like, I'll give you just a quick background. This is during the time of David um, where he has his mighty men. He's got this like army of mighty men who are with him. And it's talking about those mighty men. That's kind of the context. And it says in verse 11, and next to him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Herorite. The Philistines gathered together at Lehi where there was a plot of ground full of lentils. And the men fled from the Philistines. But he took his stand in the midst of the plot and defended it and struck down the Philistines. And the Lord worked a great victory. You were made for this. You were made for this. I wonder if Shama, this person Shama, knew before this event happened that he was made to stand his ground in a field of lentils and fight an army. He probably didn't know it until it came upon him. But there was probably training for years and years and years that brought him there. Don't be short-sighted. I've, uh, I've fallen prey to this in my own life where I've seen things that God's, I, that it truly is, I've seen things that God's doing um, he's putting me in places where I feel like what I'm doing is pointless. I'm doing work that doesn't matter. I'm not impacting anyone's life. I'm like David maybe in the fields being a shepherd in some cases, right? Just like tending to sheep while the army's out <laughs> doing the things that matter. I felt that way before. Don't fall victim or prey to the idea that what you're doing in the here and now doesn't matter because you are gaining a skill set that will matter in the future. God doesn't waste anything in your life. He refuses to waste things in your life. Anyway, I was reading this, and how cool is it this this guy? It's just a, it's just a field of lentils, right? The, they're outnumbered. They're on the run, him and the other warriors. And something in him looked at this field of lentils and said, this is food. I've heard some teaching on this. I've actually heard different perspectives on it. The, the depth within Scripture is considerable. That there, you can learn multiple things within one passage. Um, but what stuck out to me was he, he, he stood where the food was and said, no, they're not taking our food. We've been running from them, but, but now they're going to take our food. And he, he wasn't even just thinking about himself at this point. He was probably thinking about those around him. Thinking, what are they going to eat? What are the communities out here going to eat when they either take all our food or burn the fields. And he said, no, not today. I'm standing my ground here because this matters and this is where I'm going to fight. And God worked a great victory there. Where's the food in your life? 
Well, that's an interesting question. <laughs> There's a verse uh, in Proverbs that says, why spend money on that which is not food? <laughs> which I always use it as, as an excuse to eat out <laughs> at expensive restaurants. Why spend money on that which is not food? <laughs> but I think what we're getting at, what he's getting at, and what's kind of being got at here, there are things like, I'll say, coming to church, being ministered to, that's going to be food for your soul. Having a community, people that you can reach out to that can encourage you, that you can live and breathe with, that's food for your soul. Your kids, making sure they have what they need, that's food sometimes for your soul. Where, where is the food at? What, what's going to satisfy you? Sometimes it's even just, just, I'll be honest with you, it's like scripture time in the morning or at night whenever you do it. This is your time to eat. And we give up that time because we're tired. <laughs> I mean, I do, sometimes. But we have to choose the things in our life that satisfy us and say, no, like I'm going to stand my ground there. So that's a cool story about a guy named Shama. But <laughs> when I was looking at this, that's not the person who stuck out to me. It was, there's another person in this. It's Shama, the son of Agi. So we've got our own story. Shama had his own story. But then there's Agi. And this person, Agi, this is the only time their name is mentioned in Scripture. You won't find it anywhere else. You won't even find who was his father. There's no anything there except that he is Agi. He's the dad of this guy, Shama. And this is truly an untold story. We don't know anything about this guy. It's not in Scripture. All you have are three points. You have his son, what he named him, Shama, and what he did. You have Agi, his name, and you have where he's from, the Hararite, right? So he's from, an, or he's from the place of Hararite. I don't know where that would be. Harara? I don't know. Um, but... So we, we don't know very much about him, but I wanted to dig into this a little bit deeper and just see what's there. So if we go to the next slide, I'm going to pull up the information that we have and some of the definitions around the words and the names, um, and we're going to speculate just a little bit on what this guy's story might have been. So Agi the Hararite, father of Shema. We'll start at Hararite. What, 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 is, what does it mean to be a Hararite? Well, Hararite means mountaineer or mountain dweller, and it could also mean cursor or cursed, okay? So this guy's probably like coming from a mountainous region. Maybe he's a hillbilly, maybe he's a mountain man, but he's coming from a mountainous region, and it could be that that region is kind of viewed as a cursed place or a place where nothing good comes from, right? It's, a, it's not a great place to be. The name Agi... And before I even give the name here, well, you can see it up there, but the, before I even give the name, you know, when parents name children in the Bible, sometimes it's prophetic, right? It's like sometimes, like Jesus was named because it was like a prophetic name and it needed to be, you know, Jesus, uh, which means like the mighty one, right? Or the almighty one. Um, so some names are prophetic given to children. But most of the names you see in the Bible probably say more about the parents than they do about the kids. So like think about this. If you name your kids something, are you naming them that like prophetically? Like you might be. But in a lot of instances, the reason we name kids the way that we name them is because we have something happen in our life that's meaningful to us. And we go, I want to name my kid because like, I have this truth that I really value or this name that I think is really cool. or like you know. So it, has, it says more about the parent than it does typically the kid when they get a name. And so a gi's name is fugitive. Or it comes from this verb, a ga, which means to flee. And so this says something about a gi's parents where perhaps, and again, this is speculation, perhaps his parents were people who had to flee or were fugitives and named their son that. So they run to this mountainous region, to this cursed region, perhaps, and they have this kid and they name him, they name him fugitive because that's what their life is. It's a life of, you know, being a fugitive. And then, again, Agi names his son Shama, which says something probably about the father. It says, appalling desolation. That's a great name. <laughs> How would you like to be named Appalling Desolation? <laughs> yeah. But this, this dad, this dad is probably living in the mountains. 
His parents were probably fugitives or people that were running away from something. And he has a son and names him Shama because he's feeling desolate in a desolate place alone with no hope. And yet, this dad raises his son to be a mighty warrior. You know, as a parent, you have great creative ability in your children's lives. I consider myself probably a pretty creative person. I write lots of poetry and... Um, <laughs> I've got stuff you guys have never seen that's, that's pretty wild. I, someday I'll show it to you, maybe. May, probably not. I've got like this long fantasy epic I've been working on for years that's all poetry, but you'll probably never see it. <laughs> Actually, you know, think about the way God works. Most of the things God created, we'll never see. Think about the universe. The universe is massive. You might see it through a telescope, but you don't get to visit any of these planets out there. We're not on Star Trek. The depth of the ocean, we still don't even know what's under there. God, when he creates, he doesn't create because we are the ones to experience it. He creates because that's who he is. It's his nature. And creativity is often that way. But and I'll tell you, like, as a parent, I, I sometimes, I create a lot that has nothing to do with parenting, but I, I think the most important and the most creative thing I do, truly, if we're just talking about creativity, the most creative thing I do is be a dad. Because I have these lumps of clay <laughs> in front of me, and God's made them a certain way. There's specific types of clay. He's got a hand in their life, and he's using me as a parent to guide and shape them. What creative ability I have there. I speak to you maybe once a month or something like that, once every two months. And I can make an impact doing that. There's no one who, has, who gets impacted more by me than my kids. And as cool as sometimes the messages are that I preach, there's nothing cooler than what I do for my kids on a daily basis, though it be mundane. And so a gi is raising the son and he raises him to be something better and different than the life that he lived. And he doesn't, you know, raise him to not acknowledge any of the maybe suffering that happened in the mountain world that they came from, the mountainous region. But he raised him to stand up for things that matter. And look at, look at even just the picture that we have in this story. They're running from the enemy. They're fleeing. And they're in a position now where if they don't keep running, something bad's going to happen to them. They're probably going to get slaughtered, so they got to keep running. It's a bit of a cursed region, you might say. And to stand your ground would mean to be alone, probably, because everyone else is running. T to stand your ground would mean to feel maybe appalling desolation in that moment, like they're all gone, and it's just me, and here comes the army. But this son, Shama, was raised to stand out, maybe even from his entire background. The dad might have raised him in such a way that it changed the entire history of their lineage and who they were going to be. I think that's so cool. So, um, parenting matters. Parenting matters. I, was, uh, I had a shirt picked out that I was going to wear today, and it wasn't this one. And I put it on, and I realized there was this, like, gigantic brown stain on the front. I'm like, did someone poop on my shirt? Like, I don't, what happened? But I couldn't wear it. And so I looked down, and the first shirt I saw was this uh, incredible dad shirt that my kids got me for, uh, <laughs> they, they got it for me for Father's Day. And so I was like, well, that's kind of fitting for my message. I guess I'll wear that. So uh, I'm wearing the incredible dad shirt. I think our children... For better or worse, I don't know if it's always good, but they, they can look at us like we're superheroes, right? We, they depend on us for like everything, especially if they're young kids. Um, and they look at us as superheroes. And I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about this guy, Agi, and I was like, man, he kind of was a superhero. Like, we talk about Shama, but like, Agi was kind of like Odin, you know? Like, he like raised Thor to be awesome. Um, at least that's the way I see it. And I was thinking about being a dad and going... You know, I, I have that potential. I have that ability. It's so cool. 
but I often just feel like I'm doing a terrible job. <laughs> and I think most parents experience that shame. Like, oh, like I'm just not doing that great of a job. And I was thinking back to all like the Marvel movies and like there's a common thread where there's this superhero arc where they're doing superhero stuff and saving the day and suddenly they either make a mistake or something bad happens that they didn't foresee and like they were not able to stop it and then suddenly the superhero, they have this like moment where they're like sitting on a rooftop or like on a beach. They're just like, you know, they're just like sitting there and they're thinking about do I still want to be a superhero? Do I still want to do this thing? And then a friend or somebody comes along and reminds them that with great power comes great responsibility or, you know, one of the other quotes. <laughs> and they tell them that, they tell them the truth. And the truth is if you don't stand up right now and if you don't shake off this shame that you're feeling, evil's already won because they're going to just run wild because they know they've beaten you and they didn't even have to beat your superpowers. They just made you feel ashamed until you quit. As a parent, you're going to make mistakes. Dust yourself off. Get back in there. Try again. Because God's given you superpowers to raise your kids. You have powers that no one else has. You have authority in their life that no one else has. You have abilities and talents and skills that you're meant to pass on to them. You're supposed to teach them things that you learned in your past that God gave you to hand down. It's part of your story. You don't give up because you've made mistakes. The next day is always a new day. Get back up. Get back up. You're meant to be the incredible dad, the incredible mom. And that doesn't mean that you're always going to do everything right. See, we've got this like weird vision of what parenthood is. It's either like, I don't know where this came from, but it's not right. It's like, either I do everything right and I'm like the perfect parent, or I do everything wrong and I'm a terrible parent. It's like there's no like room for like, hey, I've done these things really well and I can get better at a couple other areas and I'm going to work at that. <laughs> like for whatever reason in the mind of parents, sometimes it becomes this dichotomous relationship between good and evil. And it's like, well, <laughs> you're a human being. You need God's grace. Keep pushing. Keep going. Because who knows whether or not you're supposed to raise a shama in our world. Who's supposed to stand for things that matter. Yeah. A quick story here. I um because I want to I want to kind of like paint a little bit of a brief picture here of what what parenthood can be. I was talking about parenthood being creative. I when Gideon was a young kid, um he he had this like thing that maybe I taught him to do and I'm not sure if I did or not where if we would build something, he would just like knock it down and laugh and it would be like funny. And I like I have a vague memory that maybe I did that with him when he was like 2 or something. Um, and it was like a funny thing. Like, but then it became this thing where that's all he would ever do was break stuff. Like he wouldn't build literally anything. And it was kind of frustrating for us. I, Jan and I were talking like one night, like why doesn't he like build stuff? Like all he does is break stuff. <laughs> he was like, that's it. And so I was like, yeah, that is kind of weird. And I'm not sure exactly why. Um, but when we had one of our kids, I think it was Teddy. It might've been Teddy. Um, I had four months of paternity leave, which was incredible. Um, it's a tr true blessing. Um, and so every day, or almost every day, I decided that I would take Gideon and we'd work on this, like a rector set thing that would create this big old rocket ship. And, and for you guys who don't know me, I'm terrible with like tools. Like I'm not good at it. And these like rector sets have like these tiny little like screws and nuts and bolts. And there's like thousands of pieces. And it's like, for me, oh, for me, that's not great. And so I'm doing this with him for probably like an hour every day, every other day. And we're just sitting down there doing it. And it's terrible really for me. <laughs> and it's slow. Oh, cr being creative in your kid's life, it's not fast. You're running a marathon. Don't expect it to be like, I did something great one day. It's done. You're running a marathon. It's every day. And it's in the mundane and the tedious. It's probably in the stuff that you don't like to do. <laughs> that's, it's just kind of the way it works sometimes. And so I'm building erector sets with him. He's like kind of engaged, but he's like not loving it. Like he's like, yeah, it's okay. Well, this is kind of fun. And after about a couple months of doing that, he starts building things on his own 
because he sees this rocket ship coming together and becoming something that's kind of fun. And a couple months after that, we, you know, we finish it, and he's, like, so excited to have his rocket ship, and then, like, he's done with it. <laughs> after, like, two days, it's like, we put in all this work, and he's like, eh, all right, I'm on to the next toy. Like, okay, thanks. But since that time, and Janet can confirm this, he doesn't break things almost ever. Like, he never does. And it was this cool experience of going, man, like, I actually can impact my kids. I actually can have an impact. <laughs> they're not just going to do whatever it is that they're going to do. Like, as a parent, I kind of have, have a place here. It's kind of cool. It's a fun thing. See it as a fun thing more than just a heavy weight, all right? You get to shoot an arrow. Think of a child as an arrow. You get to point them. You get to be their launch pad. Point them where you think God wants them to be. Be creative. The last thing I want to say here has to do with um, the other side of parenting. It's, it's being a kid. And uh, some of you may have had experiences with your parents growing up that weren't great. It's a reality. Or your parents did their best, but they failed a lot. Or just sometimes, okay? This is, this is reality. This is where we live. Um, and I was reading this other story in, in Second Kings. It's talking about um, one of the kings named Josiah. And both his dad and his grandpa were previous um, kings or leaders of Israel, and, or Judah, I think it was, and they both did evil in the sight of the Lord, it said. So they've got this family heritage of disobeying God's commands, of not doing what they're supposed to do, and people dying. And Josiah, we'll start in 2 Kings 22, 1 through 2. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. Imagine that. And he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. His mother's name was Jedidah, daughter of Adiah. I'm going to mess up all these names. She was from Bozkath. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed completely the ways of his father David, David, not turning aside to the right side or to the left. I love this. It says he did what was right in the, in the sight of the Lord, right? And then it points to who he followed. It was the ways of his father David. David wasn't his dad. <laughs> his dad was evil. David was not his dad. David is farther up the generational chain, right? Like, but, he po but God points out the true heritage. Yeah. And we have a heavenly father. Your real dad isn't actually here on earth. He's in heaven. He's your real dad. So you are not chained. You are not tied down to the mistakes of your parents or to their parents or to all the way up to Adam. You are not at all chained down to those things. Can I set you free for a moment? You might have things that you've realized in your life and you go, oh, that comes from my mom. Oh, that comes from my dad. Oh, I, you know, I can't help it. Well, less, listen to me. You might not be able to if we're just working with, with earthly stuff, but you've got a dad in heaven who you can learn from, who you can remember. He's the one who created you. He's the one who wrote your story. He's the one who created you special and different. You are not tied down to those things. God's here to break curses in your life. Generational curses, they are a real thing, guys, but you don't have to be stuck inside of one. You can break free. It might not be comfortable, it might not be easy, but it's right and it's there and it's coming. Look what happens here. Hilkiah, the high priest, this is the same story, said to Stephan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law. This happens when Josiah is king. I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. He gave it to Shepen, who read it. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. The book, the Bible, at that time, like the book of the law was like a portion of the Bible. It was missing. It had been left out. It had been disregarded. Scripture was not a part of what the kings or anybody else was really reading. And this dude found it. <laughs> and he brought it up. And when the king heard it, he goes, oh my, and he rips his robes because they're not following it at all. And he, then the king called, this is uh, 2 Kings 23, then the king called together all the el elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the temple of the Lord with the people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets, all the people from the least to the greatest. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the temple of the Lord. The king stood by, stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and keep his commands statutes and decrees with all his heart and all his soul, thus confirming the words of the covenant written in the book. 
Then all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. That's a beautiful thing. He stood his ground. This is basically, honestly, this is the same thing as the story of Shama. It's the same thing. The king came in the midst of this circumstance where everything's flowing one direction. It's all going this way. And the king stops and he goes, I'm not going that way anymore. I'm following the heritage of my real dad, David, my real dad, my, my real father, God, right? I'm turning this way and we're going to push through this current this river that's flowing the other way. We're going to push through it because this is what God's called me to do. You don't have to be like everyone else. In fact, God's called you to not be. You don't have to follow the ways of the people around you. In fact, God's called you not to do that. You've been called to be separate and different and stand out like a sore thumb and in doing so, take people with you to do the same. What a powerful thing God's put in your heart. And it's going to look different for each of you. Let's pray. God, um, thank you so much for thank you so much for being the steady foundation, for being the cornerstone, for being the thing that holds everything together through the shifting sands of wild ideas and cultural ideologies. God, thank you for always being firm. I just pray that you would motivate us even more fully to go forward and do what you've called us to do. Uh, I feel like he's, as I'm praying, he's kind of wanting me to share, share one more thing, um, and it's this. Uh, you know, think about creation. When God, we, we sang this song about, you know, God's creation, creating the billions of stars, and creation obeys his word, and so will I. When God speaks words, they happen. <laughs> the the earth did not choose whether or not to obey. When God parted the waters, it just happened. There was no choice involved. <laughs> it, it did not have a choice, in fact. It was doing the word of the Father. What is more important is to hear what he says because when he speaks into your life, it's going to change motivations. You might think, you know, I, I don't know, I mean, there's plenty of things that you can look at in your life and say, man, I'm not doing that great. Don't focus so much on obedience as you do focus on hearing him because you might be lacking motivation. The, the truth of the matter might be that you wish to do it, but you just don't have the motivation to do it. So what you need is to hear more words of the Father so that he can create in you the motivation to do these things. I know you're probably not going to hear, hear that a lot of places because I'm not saying disobey. Hear my heart. Obedience is good. There's time for obedience and it's basically every day of your life but learn how to obey. It doesn't come through your will. It comes through hearing his heart for you over and over and over and over and over, day by day. And let's do that with our kids too. Continue to confirm in them over and over and over and over again how much they are loved. <laughs> Even in a world where mistakes are made. Yeah, so thank you God for, thank you God for all all that you're doing in our life. Open our ears, God, as we go, walk through our days to hear your heart, hear your voice, hear your love for us more and more and more and more consistently so that we might live in a way that gives glory to who you are, that we might be true witnesses of the love of God, able to give testimony of that love. Thank you, Lord, for that. Amen.